You want to get Bible nerdy and enjoy a Twitter saga at the same time? I mean, you want to get deep in the weeds of a bibliological controversy and then try to weed one of the weeds with the weed whacker? Well, here I am, deep inside those weeds, stuck fast. And I refuse to come out until you watch this video. Here's the story. It's more King James only stuff, of course. But it brings up a really important point about Bible translation that I think anyone who cares about such things will appreciate. The saga began with one of the most reasonable and gracious King James onlyists that I've run into, Pastor Tom Brennan. He doesn't talk only about the King James Version. He has a lot of other good things to say in articles and books. And he has a podcast. I forget the name of it. I confess, with a friend who is similar to him in skill and in tone, Martin Wickens. So Brennan quotes Wickens in this tweet. Here's the quote. Difficult words from the correct underlying text are better than easy words from the wrong underlying text. This isn't perhaps a shot directly at me, I don't know, but it's a shot at my viewpoint, that's for sure. And it came out the same day the King James Bible Study Project came out, so there's that. Maybe I was subtweeted, maybe I wasn't, Tom only knows. My good friend Berean Barometer, who prefers the Textus Receptus, but agrees with me about the problems posed to readability by King James archaisms, offered the obvious rejoinder to Tom and Martin. How about easier words from the TR, such as in the New King James and the Modern English Version? Right! Brennan and Wickens are implying a classic two-by-two two grid. The vertical axis goes down from easy to hard. The horizontal one goes from wrong text on one side to right text on the other. This gives us four options. Brennan and Wickens mention two, hard words translating the right text and easy words translating, in their view, the incorrect or wrong text. But of course, there are two other options that are not mentioned here. You could use hard words to translate the wrong text, which nobody I know of is advocating for and is therefore an empty category. That is, there are no really hard and certainly archaic translations of the critical text. And then there's this other option, easy words translating from the correct text. Now, I reject the whole idea of right text versus wrong text. I think all major options are okay, from the texty recepti on one hand to the critical text on the other. I refuse to divide from my brothers and sisters over this issue. But it's very important to my brothers like Tom and Martin, and I think it's within their rights as Christians to prefer the traditional Hebrew and Greek texts underlying the traditional English Bible. I'm just trying to get them to see that they are openly advocating now for hard words, right text, without making any real effort I can see to explore the existing translations that exist in that upper right-hand quadrant. Easy, or I'd say intelligible, words and right text. The New King James and the Modern English Version are in that quadrant. Why don't my brothers who prefer the TR use the New King James or the MEV? And if they don't like these two major options, why not create one that fits in that quadrant? I also saw Tom in another tweet some weeks ago say that the King James Version is patently understandable. I disagree, of course, but now he's acknowledging difficult words in it. I'm not sure how to put these two tweets together. Anyways, the saga continues. You're going to have to be a true nerd to grasp this on the first try. Kudos to those who can. For those who can't, no worries, I will splain you. So, in comes an anonymous, apparently King James only poster whose Twitter handle suggests strongly that he has studied Greek. It's harpazo. That is a Greek word meaning something like I sees. I'm not sure what the story is there, but he clearly knows a thing or ten, and he, like Tom and like Martin, can actually have a conversation without it devolving into personal recriminations. I appreciate that. Listen carefully to what Harpazo says as he responds to my friend Berean Barometer's call for the use of the New King James or Modern English Version. This is the heart of my video. The New King James Version and the Modern English Version, among other problems, do not carry over the distinction between second person plural singular pronouns, which is changing the underlying TR. So Harpazo goes right for the argument that I spent so much time on in the King James Bible Study Project. And these tweets came out after that project, of course. This is an argument that is utterly standard in King James onlyism. This gets nerdy. He says that by using contemporary English second person pronouns, namely you and your and yours, instead of the Elizabethan-ish second person pronouns, I say ish because they're slightly different than the people actually spoke, but anyway, namely thee and thy and thine and ye and you and yours, the New King James and Modern English Version are changing the underlying TR. Did you follow that? 
The principle he's assuming just has to be this. Anytime a Bible translation fails to communicate all of the grammatical information in the Hebrew or Greek, it's changing God's word. Now, my friend Berean Barometer knows language. He hits Harpazo back with an excellent rejoinder by pointing to minor pieces of grammatical information that the King James Version itself fails to carry over into English. My friend said, the distinctions between masculine and feminine pronouns in Hebrew are often the key to identifying who is being addressed, especially in Song of Solomon. Does the King James Version change the underlying TR in those places by failing to carry over this distinction into English? Now, I could quibble with my friend. He's talking about the Hebrew Old Testament and not the Greek New Testament, although you could call the Masoretic text ATR, I suppose. It's the received text of the Hebrew Bible. But his point stands for sure. It's of the very nature of translation from one language to another that sometimes little bits of grammatical flotsam and syntactic jetsam can't really make it all the way across the ocean. They get knocked off the boat in transit, and they float to the bottom of the sea where they are consumed by small gelatinous creatures that are as yet undiscovered by science. The parallel example that I've given has to do with relative pronouns. On my kjvparallelbible.org website, you can see that Poignantly, I felt, the very chapter that tells us that the Bible is inspired, 2 Timothy 3, is one in which there are no translatable differences between the Textus Receptus and the critical text. But there is one untranslatable difference. It's in 2 Timothy 3.14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I'm, of course, quoting the King James there. It's actually that little word, whom. In the TR, the Greek word that's being translated there is singular. In the critical text, that word is plural. The difference is between whether Timothy learned these things Paul is talking about from one person or from more than one. The latter makes more sense in context because Paul speaks earlier in the letter of Timothy's grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. Apparently, that's where he's learning these things. Or Paul may be referring to himself as the TR makes it seem. You know, that's not impossible at all. So why don't I reflect this difference at the King James Parallel Bible? The Greek words are different. It's because English cannot make this distinction. English does not mark relative pronouns for number. There isn't whom and whoms. There's just whom. And context has to tell you whether it's singular or plural. A little grammatical information floated away during the Bible's boat trip from Greece to Britain. The thing is, though, that my friend Berean Barometer brought up an example in which that grammatical information isn't inconsequential. The information that gets lost, it matters. It helps with interpretation. It helps you know who's talking to whom. And yet English does not have grammatical gender. It has no direct or efficient way of communicating the little bits of meaning that my friend is talking about. So let me fill out what he said. I'm going to go back to Brian Barometer's tweet. Listen to two verses in the King James here. Who's talking to whom here in the Song of Solomon? Is this the man talking or is it the woman talking? Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved. Yea, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. Well, the first line is a tip-off. It's usually men who tell women that they are fair and have dove's eyes. But the Hebrew has grammatical information that the King James omits, that all English translations must omit because English doesn't have grammatical gender. In fact, these two lines are spoken by different characters, and the Hebrew makes this perfectly clear. Verse 15 is the man speaking to the woman because the word thou is grammatically feminine in Hebrew. Thou, woman, in other words, art fair. Verse 16 switches to the woman speaking to the man. She too says, thou art fair. Even if that sounds like something a man would say, it's not in this case. And we know this because she uses the grammatically masculine form of the word thou in Hebrew. No form of English since Old English, which did have grammatical gender, has been able to reflect this particular grammatical information. There's just no way to do it, so it has to be left out. This is why paratextual features, information that is formally outside the Bible text, supplied by the editors, like footnotes or headings, this is why this kind of stuff has to be used. And this is why you'll see she and he headings in different paragraphs in modern translations of the Song of Solomon. At this point, I have to say, I normally expect King James-only interlocutors to say something like, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. In other words, long experience tells me that Berean Barometer is about to get reviled personally. Harpazo will go for the ad hominem in this saga uh, because he's just been shown up. 
But to his credit, he does not do this. He tracks with Berean Barometer, and the saga continues. He does not give in. He has one more gambit. He says, did the King James translators change what the underlying text said, or did they convey a more complex gender and grammatical system into existing English? In other words, it's translated correctly for what English allows. For second-person pronouns, English has a system the New Bibles ignore. I think the money quote here comes in at the end, in the last two sentences, and especially that final one. What indeed does English allow? What is English? Does English have a system the New Bibles ignore? No. English is not a static thing. It changes over time. It once had grammatical gender back in the Old English period. It no longer does. It once had a case system, little barnacles from which still cling to words like he, which is nominative, and him, which is objective case, like who, which is nominative, and whom, which is objective. But it no longer, English no longer has a case system. Likewise, English once distinguished between second person singular and second person plural pronouns. Clearly, it no longer does. To say English has a system is to make a claim about the way people actually speak and write. English is the set of words, grammatical rules, sound expectations, spelling conventions, etc., etc., that are actually in use by English speakers today. But no one alive today actively uses the singular plural distinction that Harpazzo is describing. So English does not allow what Harpazzo is saying it allows. It forbids it, just like Elizabethan English forbade the reflection of singular and plural in relative pronouns like whom, and of course, modern English still does. And this is basically the point that ends the saga, or the portion of it which we have time for today, because my friend Berean Barometer uses a link to my King James Bible Study Project to point out that, quote, apparently even King James-only pastors largely ignore this system. In that project, if you didn't see it, I showed via a poll of 100 King James-only pastors that, indeed, they do not generally remember to distinguish singular from plural second-person pronouns while reading the King James Version. They get the easy ones from context, like we all do in any translation, but when context is ambiguous or even points the other direction, they don't remember and use the system in use in the King James Version. As of the moment that I took this screenshot, the conversation stopped there, and this is where we will stop. Twitter is round after round after round of this kind of thing. Almost no one ever admits defeat. They just go silent and either lick their wounds or throw up their hands in disgust that their opponents just can't see the light. Hey, my side does this too, and I absolutely mean that. But I'm praying that my King James Bible Study Project will become the classic conversation ender for any King James onlyist who brings up Elizabethan English second person pronouns, which is one of their most common arguments. When it comes right down to it, even King James onlyists don't use the singular plural distinction that is supposed to be so important for a close reading of the Bible. And I, for one, don't blame them for not using it. If you saw my video on this, you understand. It's not English anymore. Let's get back to the original post. From what I can tell from their public statements, Brennan and Wickens don't seem to want to consider using a translation of the TR into intelligible English. The tweeter who came to their defense, Harpazzo, made an argument that I don't think truly defends their position. So I renew my question. Brothers Tom and Martin, why not use one of the translations in that top right quadrant in the 2x2? Two two? Why not use a translation of the TR into contemporary, fully intelligible English, pursuant to the teaching of 1 Corinthians 14, that edification requires intelligibility?